Hi there, Pete here. Hope everyone is well. Back again helping to dispel some of the nonsense in the world. In this video, we'll be looking at human evolution and focusing on the phrase Survival of the fittest. Now I'm sure we're all familiar with the idea of evolution, a theory explaining the origins of the human species. The term survival of the fittest, coined by Herbert Spencer in 1864, was first introduced into evolutionary theory as a means to describe the mechanism of natural selection, a key process in evolution itself. Darwin, the man most noted for the idea of evolution, later adopted Spencer's phrase in 1868 and included it within his fifth edition of On the Origin of Species. With this in mind, who best to provide us with a few definitions of the phrase survival of the fittest than Charlie himself? Survival of the form that will leave the most copies of itself in successive generations. The idea that species adapt and change by natural selection with the best suited mutations becoming dominant. Thanks Charlie, I hope you haven't eaten too many bananas. Now from the definitions it would appear species that adapt and change more favourably to their environments are basically fitter to survive. In other words, through reproduction favourable characteristics are passed on that help in the survival of that species. So if you're a woolly mammoth and weren't able to adapt to a different environment, like to a tropical desert island, you and your offspring would simply become extinct over time, or become dead as dodos. Yet although from a biological standpoint, the phrase survival of the fittest is not generally used by modern day biologists as the phrase refers to reproductive success, rather than survival, the term has found its way into popular culture being attributed to cutthroat economic competition or providing a justification for behaviour that undermines moral standards. But even though evolution is just a theory attempting to explain human origins and survival of the fittest or natural selection are key mechanisms, my question with particular reference to the human species is, do the fittest really survive? Well, to help answer this question, we initially need to understand what we mean by the word fit. So here's Arnie with a few definitions. OK, be try these. Of a suitable quality standard or type to meet the required purpose. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger is your name, silly. And that other one didn't really fit the bill. I don't want all those evolutionists throwing eggs at me and me having to ask them where the bacon is, do I? So can't you try a little harder? Duh. How about a few biological definitions of the word fitness, as they'd be better? OK, Pete. A biological condition in which a competing variant is increasing in frequency relative to other competing variants in a population. A relative measure of reproductive success of an organism in passing its genes to the next generation. The relative ability of an individual or population to survive, reproduce and propagate genes in an environment. The ability of an organism to survive and reproduce in its environment. Thanks, Arnie, for that lot, even though you didn't sound anything like him. Well, from the definitions, reproduction is a common feature. And so, with regard to evolutionary theory, an organism's fitness to survive means that an organism must reproduce. Now, that makes perfect sense especially when the only way we as humans can ever survive is through reproduction. 
This is borne out whenever we read obituaries in local newspapers where a deceased person is said to be survived by their children. So it is clear that reproduction equals survival. However, as an established term within evolutionary theory, survival of the fittest becomes questionable when we look at certain groups within the human species. As a little girl, Lily Marcus loved playing with dolls. She was a star babysitter in the neighborhood. But when it came to wanting children one day, Lily had very different ideas. I really enjoy being around children, but even when I was young, I just kind of knew in the back of my head it wasn't something that I wanted. And she's not alone. According to a recent Pew Center study, nearly one in five American women ends her childbearing years without giving birth, up from one in 10 in the 1970s. As a freelance writer, Lily penned a column discussing her choice to be child-free, and she says the responses from readers came as no surprise. I was expecting people to tell me that I was selfish. I get that all the time. Um, I was expecting people to tell me that I was less of a woman because that's something that I get all the time. I, Peter, take you, David, to be my lawful wedded husband. I, Peter, take you, David, David, to be my lawful wedded husband. I, David, take you, Peter, to be my lawful wedded husband. I, David, take you, Peter, to be my lawful wedded husband. I am now very happy to announce that you are now legally This threshold is probably like half an hour, would you say? Public places, then he gets overstimulated. Well, and also, you know, depriving him of something, of course. It's okay, Saying buddy. no. Now, from looking at the target groups within the clips, according to evolutionary theory, it would seem such individuals are unfit as they are unlikely to survive through reproduction. Moreover, groups with individual characteristics, such as what we've seen, have been recurrent throughout man's history, occurring time and time again. So it cannot be the case that only the fittest survive, for if it were, then it would make sense that over thousands of years such groups would become extinct. I guess Darwin, Dawkins and the rest of the evolution gang dislike people who don't reproduce. But nevertheless, some of you might disagree and think the fit do survive. Evolution is a fact. Darwin and sons aren't homophobic. Well, let's expand our definitions of the words fit and fitness to include health and well-being. More and more families are torn apart by mental illness, but many say they don't have to be. State Senator Cree Deeds, whose scars inside and out are still healing, is working with police to make sure others don't have to go through what his family did. Only on NBC 29 tonight, Kat Boardman takes us inside the world of police, politicians, and mental health professionals. Those groups have a long road ahead. There are not any quick and easy solutions when it comes to issues involving mental health. But tonight, it's clear police in Central Virginia are getting more calls than ever before to help mentally ill people. But what we wanted to know was why. Why is that number increasing? And what are officers doing to adjust? The thing is, you, you know, you, the sadness doesn't really go away. Virginia State Senator Cree Deeds is one of many struggling to overcome grief. You, you get used, to, you, you, you learn to live, you know, but, but it's never the same. 
It can't be. In November of 2013, Deeds's 24-year-old son Gus stabbed Deeds, forever scarring his face and chest. Then Gus, suffering from bipolar disorder, shot and killed himself. There's never any real recovery. Since 2011, dispatchers for the Albemarle County Police have seen calls to help mentally ill people increase by 54 percent. Charlottesville Police have seen 22 percent more. We're not going to fix someone. Someone may always live with a mental health illness, but if we can get them treatment, education, and maybe some prevention built in, then we can we can head down the right path. Sergeant Greg Davis teaches crisis intervention training to law enforcement officers. What we teach them is this is somebody's loved one. This is somebody's mother, brother, daughter, son, cousin. How would you want somebody to treat your loved one in the same circumstance? The national model is to have at least 25% of your officers trained, and but the three police chiefs, uh, Chief Longo, Colonel Sellers, and Chief Gibson, want 100% of their officers trained in CIT. The class tries to arm officers with a new weapon, empathy. During one session, officers put in headphones and try to accomplish simple tasks like a crossword puzzle while listening to this. Shirt, a lyric picture, wipe the smirk off your face. You think this is funny, don't you, huh? Do you think this is some kind of joke? Well, it's not a joke. We can talk about it intellectually, but to actually walk in somebody's shoes with the voices and the sounds that they have to suffer with on a daily basis gives a small insight, a small glimpse of the hurt and the pain that somebody's going through. In Greenwich and the school has just become one of the government's new wave of academies. There are more than 1,400 across England and they're not obliged to follow the healthy food standards. Although many, like Corelli College, will, there's concern that unhealthy, high-profit foods are already creeping back onto menus. Our members up and down the country are telling us that they are being approached to reintroduce snack items, perhaps confectionery, sausage rolls, that sort of thing, at, mainly at mid-morning break. And our members provide food to thousands of schools across the country. And we're really concerned that this might be the start of a return to poorer nutrition in schools. Well, what this study found was that for every 50 grams of processed meat that people ate every day, they had an increased risk of around 20%, slightly less than 20%. So we're talking about if you eat a couple of rashers of bacon each day, then you have a 20% higher risk of pancreatic cancer than someone who eats no meat at all. Mm. What? Yes, on the face of it, that's, that sounds like quite a major major hike because there are people who would routinely yeah. eat a cooked breakfast every day. Well, the reason why this is so important is because pancreatic cancer is such a difficult cancer to treat. Um, so obviously everything that we can do to find out about how to prevent the disease developing in the first place is absolutely crucial. So I, sh I should point out that in terms of the increased risk compared to something like smoking or being overweight, this risk is not quite as large. Um, but it is still important and it is still an increase in, in risk. And it's, it's a message for the public that um, if they are eating processed meat every day, they might want to consider cutting down for a number of reasons, um, including now their risk of pancreatic cancer. Do you know how many people suffer from pancreatic cancer? Because that amount of meat a day doesn't, won't sound, as Charlie says, to most people like an awful lot and would be very commonly eaten and would suggest that pancreatic cancer is quite common. Well, it's the 10th most common cancer in the UK, with about 8,000 people mm. developing it each year. Um, and the sad thing about pancreatic cancer is that also each year about 8,000 people die from the disease. It's got a, a, quite a low survival rate compared to other cancers. From the outside, Nelson Pratt from Hampshire had everything. He had an exciting life as a professional snowboarder. He was successful, popular and physically fit. Last summer, the 33-year-old found himself struggling with moderate depression. So he went to a GP, was given a questionnaire to fill in, and told to come back a fortnight later if he didn't feel any better. The next day, Nelson killed himself. Well, it's um, desperately worrying. It's not just the online bullying, but other things like self-harm and uh, suicidal thoughts. Um, there are a lot of very unhappy children in our country. Now, aside from the fact that police officers in central Virginia are probably going insane, if you develop pancreatic cancer, according to figures, you've got no hope of survival. Completing a questionnaire probably won't make you feel any better, 
and growing up in the UK for many children is an unhappy experience. Can anyone notice anything odd about the clips we've just seen? Well, yes, of course, from the clips. Although just a small sample, it certainly is evident that the human species aren't entirely fit and healthy. Yes, human beings are plagued by ill health. So returning to evolutionary theory, it seems to be more of a case that it's survival of the unfittest. <laughs> Yes, having this understanding ensures that humankind secures the survival of even the most unhealthiest of individuals, and in so doing, creating lots of jobs in the process, within education, health and charitable sectors to name a few. Moreover, with the continued presence of unfit individuals within the human species, it seems the problem lies within breeding rather than anything related to evolution. Well, there you go. It certainly seems nonsense to ever consider humans to have evolved where the fittest survive. With the high numbers of unfit individuals, it makes more sense to consider that it's really a case of survival of the unfittest. Given this, it also seems likely that evolutionary theory is nonsense and more likely that humans are as much related to chimpanzees as a door is to a table. For even though they are both made of wood, the door and the table have totally different characteristics. So next time you ever decide you want to reproduce in order to survive, always ensure the mother or father of your offspring is right for you. By doing this, you stand more chance of securing the survival and total fitness of your offspring. So till next time, always remember, if something doesn't make sense, it's nonsense.